welcome to the Farm Bits Podcast, a product of Nebraska Extension Digital Agriculture. I'm Jackson Stansel. And I'm Samantha Teton. And we come to you each week to discuss the trends, the realities, and the value of digital agriculture. Through interviews and panels with experts, producers, and innovators from all sectors of digital technology, we hope that you step away from each episode with new practical knowledge of digital agriculture technology. Welcome back to the Farm Bits podcast for our fourth episode in the nitrogen management technology series and our 35th episode of the Farm Bits podcast. Yep. <laughs> Capturing soil, soil mineralization and early season nitrogen losses is often the missing piece of nitrogen management decisions that farmers have to make. And so using responsive nitrogen management techniques such as active crop canopy sensors, as described in this episode, can help fill this gap. Yeah, so our guest for this episode is Dr. Jim Shepard, an emeritus professor in agronomy at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, who has spent a career working with sensor-based nitrogen management through the USDA ARS. Jim helped to develop the sufficiency index concept, which contributed to the development of active crop canopy sensors offered commercially today. This episode provides a really good broad orientation to sensor-based nitrogen management, and it will set up our next few episodes. So let's dive right into our interview with Jim. Jim, we appreciate you being here with us today and kind of doing your first podcast here with us. Um, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, where you come from, and how you how you got to where you are today? Okay, I'm a farm boy from Platte River Valley, up between Kearney and Grand Island. I grew up with 4-H and then FFA, and came off to the university in, in agronomy, and. Uh, member of agronomy club and those kind of things. But on the farm, we grew up with corn and alfalfa, soybeans, few cattle, few pigs, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. So I got exposed to lots and lots of farming activities and I still have that in my blood, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so uh, can you tell us a little bit about your career and kind of how you got into the nitrogen management area that we're focusing on? Today? When I've always been intrigued by by fertilizers because we would see how the crops responded to fertilizer. And one of the teachers back in, a, in agronomy said, the soil is a lousy place to store nitrogen. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. and, and he was just right. And so when I went off to, to graduate school at Illinois, that got me, I'll say, in, in a position that had some plant physiology and things like that. I taught soil physics at the University of Georgia for two years and did irrigation research with corn. Hmm. So in 1975, the USDA job opened up here in Nebraska and I was solicited to come here. But at that time, they were just starting to have problems with nitrate in the groundwater of the Platte River Valley. Mm -hmm. And as we talked to farmers and said, you know, you guys are gonna have problems here. An old Professor Olson, who told us about a lousy place to store nitrogen, said, you boys are going to have trouble out here if you keep putting on this much fertilizer. Mm -hmm. So as we talked to farmers about this, they said, well, if you want us to cut back on the amount of fertilizer we put on, you're going to have to find a way to identify the problem before it reduces yield. And then you have to find a way for us to fix the problem. Right. And, and so that sent me back to Illinois on a sabbatical leave to talk to the plant physiology people. Hmm. And, and the uh, professor Hageman, he says, you're just going to have to measure chlorophyll. That's the driving factor. Sure. He said, if you want to measure nitrogen, that's okay, but be careful because corn plants have luxury consumption. So you never know how much extra is sitting around there in the corn plant? And you don't want to become up short. Sure. Mm -hmm. But you'd also like to know when you're at the peak. Right. And if you monitor chlorophyll, you're going to be able to uh, associate that with nitrogen. So that, that's what got us into this. Gotcha. That's, that's pretty cool. That's yeah. a, I, I haven't heard the story in such detail. 
that's what we really want to focus on today is that sensor-based nitrogen management. But before we kind of get into that, can you talk about some of the other methods to determine nitrogen rates? So such as models or yield goal-based methods. Why is this sensor-based so different and why is that important? We need to go back just a little bit okay. from, yeah. from our uh, guidance from Illinois. It said, you're going to have to measure chlorophyll. And at that time, the instrumentation was not there to do this conveniently. And so we made some leaf punches mm -hmm. to, to punch little holes in the leaves. We would send one off for chlorophyll, one off for nitrogen analysis. Mm -hmm. And after about three years of this, we had a, a stack of the yield response functions. Sure. And we look at them and say, well, the shape is about the same, but how do we make sense of this? And this is where we came up with the, I'll say the uh, sufficiency index concept of laying one graph over the other one and shifting them around to sure. say, oh, there is something here. And it, it's all tied to that nitrogen rich or the high nitrogen rate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in, in 1990, chlorophyll meters came on to the market from Minolta. And we had a large water project at the time. So that's how we started using the sufficiency index to monitor the crop and schedule fertigation. Sure. But that's a good research tool, but it's not very good for practical purposes <laughs> on farmer's <laughs> field. Right, right. And so I told Tracy Blackburn, our graduate student, I said, what we need is a mobile version of the chlorophyll Sure. And so he went to work bothering people in all the different departments who had some kind of a sensor. And that's what led us to LICOR, who built us some preliminary sensors. Sure. And, and then Kyle Holland, he would watch us. And he said, you guys are always out there calibrating these things to a spectral on panel, something that is known reflectance. Mm -hmm. That's a pain in the butt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and he said, I can build you an active sensor. Okay, we're ready. To go, ahead. <laughs> go to it. Mm -hmm. And so that's the, the birth of uh, the crop circle sensors. Hmm. Just out of the, the old chlorophyll meters. So, what is the information these chlorophyll meters are really capturing that allows you to measure chlorophyll? Like, what sort of wavelengths and what are we looking at? What the chlorophyll meter is, is doing, I'll tell you first, it's basically a potential photosynthesis meter in that it generates extra red light. Okay. And it says to the plant leaf, it says, use as much as you want, but what you can't use, I'm going to measure. Sure. And, and so it, it cranks the leaf up to saying, do everything you possibly can. Yeah. And, and whatever's left over, I'm going to measure it, and, and we're going to use that to quantify how, how much uh, photosynthesis is possible. Mm -hmm. But crop production and that photosynthesis is impacted by lots of other things, such as water stress. So can you explain a little bit of how you're differentiating that to nitrogen stress? Yeah. Water stress comes first. And, and what we found is that if you well, as, as a plant grows, it gets bigger and bigger, and the sensors are monitoring and measuring near infrared reflectance. Plants can't use that weight band. Sure. And we can't see it. Mm -hmm. Sure. But insects can. So that, that's where they know to go mm -hmm. um, harvest, chew on leaves, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. huh. But the more vegetation you have out the more reflectance you get with near infrared light. Sure. And so that's one of the components. The other one is the chlorophyll. So if you have lots of chlorophyll, it's going to use as much red light as it can. Yep. And so there will not be as much red light reflected. So sure. it's one's up, NIR is up, uh, red reflectance is down. And so it becomes a very sensitive measure of crop vigor. Sure. And yeah. is that where the NDVI then and some of these other vegetation yeah. indices come from? Yeah. NDVI was really developed for forestry purposes to develop and understand 
how much vegetation is in a forest. Sure. Hmm. But it, it works also for many other crops. Yeah. And so we've always heard, I guess, on our end, that the NDVI tends to, to saturate, right? So if you've got a lot of crop canopy out there, a lot of biomass, then you really don't have any red uh, reflectance. And so your measurement basically always becomes close to close to one. And so the NDRE, I guess, is an improvement on that yes. particular measurement. As soon as the canopy closes on corn, NDVI becomes a random number generator. And that there, there's shadows and, and all kinds of other things going on there. But if you switch to a, another wave band that doesn't go to very low levels. Right. It, it can be a constant level, like uh, near infrared reflectance or like a red edge reflectance. Mm -hmm. It doesn't change much. And many people say, well, red edge is more sensitive. That wave band itself is not. It gets very stable. Sure. And it, it has about the same reflectance as bare soil. Right. Huh. But in combination, the NDRE wave band or, or vegetation index is considerably more uh, sensitive than NDVI, sure. except at the very low levels where you still see some soil. Sure. Hmm. I guess what well, you have to get rid of soil pixels when yeah. you're actually <laughs> going to use imagery to uh, <laughs> yep. do NDRE. That's interesting. And then you guys have also taken that one step further to uh, for nitrogen recommendations with a nitrogen high nitrogen reference strip or a virtual reference to help make sure that you're detecting nitrogen stress. Could you describe that a little bit for our listeners? The, the high nitrogen strip idea goes back to the plot studies we had with the, the uh, leaf punches and tissue testing. Um, we, we said if you have a, a nitrogen rate that's above what you need, that's a, essentially a high nitrogen strip in the field. Sure. Um, that, that works well. But what we found over time is that there are some situations. Uh, North Dakota, we found it in Missouri, where if you put on too much nitrogen, create that nitrogen strip, the, the plants appear to be stunted. Hmm. And, and what's happening here is that Sulfur is also leachable, just like nitrate. And so in those situations, the nitrogen to sulfur ratio in the plant was out of balance. Sure. And so um, that's why we say you got to be careful of a high nitrogen strip. Now, the other part of the story is that in Europe, they're not allowed to, to over fertilize. They usually fertilize their wheat three or four times. Because if you give it too much at once, it's likely to lodge and go down. Sure. So they spoon feed their wheat several times in the year. And they're not allowed to over fertilize. So no nitrogen, no high nitrogen strips. And so this is where Kyle Holland came up with the idea of the virtual strip because early in the season when you're sensing, that plant doesn't need the full dose of nitrogen. Right. It can get by with a whole lot less and be better for it to boot. So mm -hmm. sure, absolutely. And so, you know, we know from working in this space that sufficiency index comes from basically measuring that reflectance value, right? Or that, that, that vegetation right. index value yes. within the high nitrogen and then comparing it to some other area in the crop, you know, just maybe normal crop areas or seeing a normal nitrogen rate to, to measure the sufficiency at those locations. Now, so that's our sufficiency index. There's also a response index, right? That was come up with at Oklahoma State. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the differences in these methods? Well, <laughs> it turns out the sufficiency index concept is patented. Okay. It was developed as part of the activities of Flycor. Okay. And since it was, I'll say my idea, they had to turn the patent over to the US Department of Agriculture. Huh. And, and because it was patented, um, people could not use it for commercial purposes. Research was fine, but commercial was forbidden. Sure. And the Oklahoma people didn't want to get caught up legally. Hmm. And so what they did, they, they flipped it over. 
inverted it uh, and said, well, if the farmers find it easier to understand how much more they could gain rather than how much short you are, how much deficient you are. Sure. We'd like to talk about how much more we can gain. Yeah. Now, the, the other deal is that the denominator of the sufficiency index is always 100%. That's right. the enrich. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have a nice linear relationship. The sufficiency or the uh, response index has got a denominator that's floating around. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so it's not a, a nice linear relationship. Sure. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And so it's still using kind of that enrich concept, but it's just flipped the, the ratio where the reflectance from that enrich is now in the numerator. That's correct. That's all it is. Huh. But there's also somewhere you have like a zero nitrogen strip, right? Where you put no nitrogen and then you're using that. Um, we mostly do that to understand minimization. Mm -hmm. But one of the hardest things to identify and quantify is, is mineralization, not only the amount, but when it becomes available relative to that growing plant, mm -hmm. and how much residue you incorporated in the soil and the previous crop. So it, it's really helpful to have a, a check strip, a, a zero nitrogen out there. Sure. Farmers don't like it, <laughs> at, at least if it's a very big area. Mm -hmm. Right. Or Good water. reason. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> they put their hand out and say, put some money in there. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So kind of getting to that, right? We brought up mineralization now. That's really the advantage of sensors versus a lot of other forms of nitrogen management is that they're in real time capturing how that nitrogen mineralization is affecting the plant. Is it, am, I, am I correct on saying that? You're, you're correct. That, um, the, the plant is a really good biological indicator of nitrogen supply, be it from fertilizer, nitrate in the water, whatever. Sure. So the plant's got roots out there that are sensing what's available to it. And by uh, using the plant, we at least have a good indication of what's been available up to that point. Now, as you look down the road further, you, you sort of have to say, well, we would expect mineralization to continue throughout the rest of the growing season, provided you have water. Right. Water comes first. <laughs> water and temperature are pretty much your prerequisites for that, right? And, and actually, temperature is really important early in the spring when the soils are warming up. Uh, if, if you have a warm spring, mineralization is going to be ahead of schedule. Okay. And, and so that plant's going to be, have access to more nitrogen. Sure. And if you monitor the crop, you say, well, I've got plenty of nitrogen out here. When in fact, it's really a temperature response. Sure. Hmm. And, and that's why it's important not to get in the field too early with the sensing. Sure. That's interesting. It is. So now you have the crop's current status measurement. How are you converting that into a nitrogen recommendation rate? So can you talk about that algorithm a little bit and how that works? Certainly. Um, there's really two approaches to this. And here in Nebraska, uh, my, my friend who designed the sensors, Kyle Holland, he's quite accomplished with mathematics. And he would hear us talk about nitrogen response functions, quadratic or quadratic plateau response functions. Mm -hmm. And he must have sat around for a long time thinking about these mm -hmm. things. But he said, you know, there's a way to tear that thing apart, understand what's going on. And so, that's what he did, that paper that we published. Mm -hmm. He was the mathematics behind it. And I tell people, my job was to keep him honest. <laughs> <laughs> and make sure that we have all the components in there that are going to be important to a farmer. Sure. And the last one we put in there was that management zone factor. Because right. we, we knew that this model wouldn't be and wouldn't contain everything. Sure. And, and management zone is, is essentially mineralization, soil type, water holding capacity, things that you can't expect that sensor to look down the road 
three months or two months and say, this is what's going to happen. Sure. Mm -hmm. But the farmer, he can put that in there as a coefficient and adjust the rate accordingly. Sure. And so when we're thinking about this algorithm, which we, we refer to as the Holland Shepherd algorithm. <laughs> okay. yeah. you know, so if we're thinking about this algorithm, it's taking in the SI that, that comes in and then the farmer set parameters with such that management zone factor and then kind of a, an optimal nitrogen rate for that field. And what, what are some of the other things that go into the algorithm? Well, there's, there's a, a term in there that it's important to know when you're sampling with the sensor because if you sample at B8 versus B12, that plant has already taken up more nitrogen at B12. And so you don't want it making the same recommendation at B8 <laughs> as it does at B12. Mm -hmm. Right. You need it to correct for that. Sure. Mm -hmm. so, so that's one of the things that's, that's taken into account. The, the other thing I should, not to sell short the other kind of algorithm, the Oklahoma algorithm was developed for wheat. And they're sensing early in the year to determine how much winter kill they had and what the yield potential is going to be. So, so their sure. idea was, let's predict yield, determine how much extra nitrogen we're going to need to bring that yield up. Right. And, and so they're back calculating. It's a mass balance approach. Sure. But what they're not doing is taking into account the fact that not only do you want to bring up the, the grain, the, the bushels, right? but you got to grow that plant first. Sure. Mm -hmm. and, and they weren't putting that in to their equation. So they've tried to fix that now, but um, little things like that yeah. just would, would tend to have it under predict the amount of fertilizer you need, mm -hmm. especially when you went to corn. Sure. And, also, they were locked into using the green seeker, which would saturate. Mm -hmm. and, and so yeah. uh, you had a, a random number generator out there with an algorithm that was developed for wheat. Yeah. And so there were some disillusioned farmers. Yeah, I can imagine. So, you know, thinking about these, these algorithms and you talked about the green seeker there, and you mentioned that Kyle Holland was, you know, partially responsible or mainly responsible for developing the crop surface sensor that came out of these early core. Absolutely, right. yes, <laughs> all the way. And, and so, so though the crop circle sensor kind of developed into the optric sense, uh, yeah. sensors that are produced by Agri, right? Can you tell us a little bit more about those? The, uh, the crop circle sensor uh, was totally developed by Holland. The ARS part of it that I worked for I'll say we were responsible for doing the field testing. Okay. So we would, in the summertime, we would test them here in Nebraska. In the wintertime, we would go to uh, Brazil. We had colleagues there that we would go down there for several weeks and, and further test and evaluate what's going on. The, uh, the sensors have migrated now because of improvements in electronics. Sure. Originally, Holland sensor used a, we call it an amber LED. It was kind of an orange light that, that also had NIR in it. Mm -hmm. Well, since that time, they've come up with full range LEDs that are very white, right? Contains all the wavelengths. So then the trick is to put filters in there that give you the wave bands that you want. Hmm. Sure. So, so that's what he's done with his sensors. The uh, Oklahoma sensor, the Green Seeker sensor, they operate differently in that they don't continuously monitor all the wave bands. It only has one detector. So it would monitor red for a while and then near infrared for a while, mm -hmm. jumping back and forth, back and forth. So mm -hmm. it was never really monitoring the same target or plant area all sure. the time. It wasn't a lot different, but uh, just part of the design. Right, trade-offs. Yes. Yeah. 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 So also speaking about some of these different sensors, can you describe like the difference between a passive and an active sensor, but also like the proximal sensors that we have been talking about, but mm -hmm. also some remote sensing technologies okay. that farmers might know? 
Yeah. The, the, the passive sensors are what we started with mm -hmm. using natural sunlight. The problems we had was cloud cover, time of day, shadows, and then on top of that, different uh, cultivars or varieties of, of the crop. And this is when uh, Kyle Holland said, this is really a pain for you to put this standard calibration panel under the sensor sure. every five minutes or something like this. Mm -hmm. You look up at the clouds and say, yeah. <laughs> come on, get out of here. <laughs> and, and so this is when he said, um, I know how to build the electronics to separate out natural sunlight from the very small extra signal that's coming from the light that, that I would generate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it takes some really fancy electronics to do that, right? Because yeah. it, it's taking a sample about 40,000 40, times a second. Wow. wow. It is small. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and so that's the, the, the secret and, and why these things will work at night as well as the daytime. Hmm. Right. Which is kind of fascinating. Would it be nice to put that on a drone and actually have the uh, the active sensor strong enough to work on the drone, right? You have to get a special license for your drone to do that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but they've done this with uh, tractor mounted sensors right. with, with cotton and grease. Hmm. Oh, it works well. Interesting. Yeah. And so those active sensors, you know, we, we work with drone imagery quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And now they have kind of the downwelling sensors that are supposed to prevent you from having to do all of that, you know, okay. calibration mm -hmm. all the time. So that's um, that's helpful, except that there's still cloud cover. Mm -hmm. right? the, 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 uh, the angle of the sun and the clouds may not affect the sensor, sure. but they do affect the brightness of the soil. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. the, the patterns on the soil so just have to be careful absolutely mm -hmm. yeah so when we think about how we're able to create an interface right we, we have these sensors that are measuring you know like you said forty thousand times a second that kind of gets distilled down i assume into kind of a, a one second reading that uh, on these commercials you know sensors get used to inform the target rate how, how are we able to integrate these sensors with complex machinery in the field to make nitrogen applications. Part of the problem is that the sensor system and the recording system has to be very high speed. But the computers in John Deere or anything else, Raven, you name it, it's pretty slow speed. Right. Kyle says they're about 286 computer speed. <laughs> pretty slow. So, okay. so what he's had to do is to put a 50 millisecond delay in there between each signal to slow down his system mm -hmm. to descend and receive to be compatible sure with, with the other system hmm. sure it's also a lot of because it's so much data so quickly there's a lot of noise there's a lot of jumping in the values is there a way to kind of even that out um the rolling average type of thing well, what, what Holland does is he uh, summarizes the data and for research purposes, he'll let you record it 10 times a second if you want to, mm -hmm. but you end up with boxcars full of right. information. <laughs> and so for fertilizer purposes, he summarizes it every one second mm -hmm. and will make a fertilizer adjustment accordingly. Sure. And in the process, that takes out a lot of the the variability. If you think about going through the field, I'll say four miles an hour, that's about six feet per second. Sure. So you're getting um, a picture of probably eight to 10 plants. It's moving in the region you're getting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, thinking about the system response to how quickly some of those SI values can change is a key yeah. uh, thing. The, the SI values can change, and, and one of the reasons for having more than one sensor is, is if you have three or four out there, you could actually write algorithms that take out 
and anything that's got a standard deviation or a CV mm -hmm. that's either high or obviously low because of uh, weeds, that can send it really high or a, we call it cultivator blight or something <laughs> else, missing plants. Sure. <laughs> that would, would send it the other way. So uh, that could give you a, a wrong fertilizer rate. But for now, that hasn't been done. It's just a, an average if you have four sensors, going sure. to give you the average of the four. Sure. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Can you talk about some of the other challenges associated with some of these measurements? So I guess you can kind of take that whichever direction you want, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the problems is that, that we've tried to, to marry uh, a high speed sensor system with. A, a sprayer system that was designed for on and off operations. Mm. Sure. Am I at the end of the field or do I turn off the right boom and the left boom? That sort right. of thing. Right. And those valves, they might have been solenoids or they might have been a, a motor controlled ball valve, but it takes two, three, maybe one second. It, it's slow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so if you're moving through the field, now farmers like to go through the field maybe at eight or 10 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. so, so now you're 15 to 20 feet down there or second. You know, and, and you've got two seconds for that valve to control. You're down the field 50 feet or so, mm -hmm. well beyond. But you say, well, maybe that isn't so bad. I'm, I've got a 120 foot boom out here. That's another problem. The sensor is, is monitoring where it is, but they're usually not out of the extremes of the boom. Right. So I think one of the situations is that it, it's nice to have those big booms for spraying weeds and this sort of thing, but for applying fertilizer, they're probably better to drop it back to 60 feet or something like that. Sure. <laughs> Just tough from a logistics standpoint, right? As far as covering a lot of ground and trying to get to all the fields that need to be side dressed. But that's right. And, and that's why we say farmers shouldn't plan to use these kind of sensors on all of their fields. It should be used on the most variable field or the fields that have had uh, grandpa put manure on, but golly, we don't know where it did. It? <laughs> right. <laughs> or there was an old farmstead here. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, Feedlot, whatever, swan so going somewhere. Like <laughs> everything like that can really, um, you can see that in the imagery for years to come. Mm -hmm. Sure. And so the, the sensor is able to pick up some of that. Yeah. And so you, you kind of, we, we've talked about this real time sensing and some of the, maybe some of the benefits with the dealing with variability and then some of the challenges, right? Of, of the real time response and systems that we have. Can you compare that versus more passive sensors and, and, and kind of the approach to sensing that requires that you process the data and look at it before you go out and make an application? There's some advantages to, I'll say, pre-processing the data. Mm -hmm. You have to collect it first. And some of the data you can pre-process might be organic matter content, water holding capacity or slope of the land, mm -hmm. things that aren't going to change very much over time. Sure. But there are other types of uh, indicators, like if you have drone information mm -hmm. or, or aircraft, even satellite information, that's pretty close to being real time. Mm -hmm. Sure. And, and that's what you'd like to process and, and get it back quickly. And, and Ideally, you'd like to be able to merge that with the common sense information that the farmer has sure. from the soil. And, and this is what you can do in the computer. And then you can feed that information into a, a John Deere or Raven or some kind of controller in, in the form of a shape file and go make your application. Mm -hmm. um, probably what you're sacrificing is the reliability of the imagery, how, how good it is if you get satellite imagery, most of the time it'll tell you 2% light cover of clouds, right. this mm -hmm. sort of thing. Right. And, and then you, a little common sense would say, 
this pattern looks strange out here. Mm -hmm. it's cloud up there. It's a shadow. Mm -hmm. you know, exactly. So there tends to be kind of that trade off of we can integrate more data, but it may take more processing or a longer time versus, you know, these on the go sensors. It's kind of a plug and play, and you're out in the field and you're flying at the same time. So there's that trade off. Yeah. What we've seen is that drones have uh, allowed people to have fun <laughs> and, and collect data yeah. and take pictures. And, and part of the problem is it's it's a, a challenge for them to say, how do we, we pick out the high nitrogen reference strip here? Mm -hmm. We've got to go in and we call it cookie cutter, trim, trim out the high nitrogen strip. It's going to take somebody to do that. Mm -hmm. right. The other way, if you use the virtual reference strip, the uh, computer can do this for you. Mm -hmm. Sure. But you say, well, that reference value might not be right for the whole field. Mm -hmm. and we're pretty sure it's not. Right. But it's it's one of these things, give and take. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. There's 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 so many given you know, <laughs> with, with sensor-based management, there's always a trade-off, right? Mm -hmm. Trying to get everything right. And you kind of brought up the idea that the sufficiency index is going to change as you go through the field. I mean, so do you, do you think this this management zone concept, whether it's the management zone indicator or adjusting for management zones with sufficiency, is kind of the next step that needs to be taken with sensor based management to get where it needs to be? I think the next step is for, for somebody to build a controller that will let the user put in two kinds of information yeah. one from, from the sensors, or it could be a, a second. Shape file. There's sure. two kinds of information, merge it together to improve the sensitivity or take into account those things that the sensor just possibly can't know about. But but that's the, the next step. And then to, to do that right, you either have to build in a management zone factor or you say, you know. We need to adjust that reference value. Sure. Be, be it come from the high nitrogen strip or from the virtual strip. But we know that the yield potential for the entire field is not the same. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And so that's what we're trying to compensate for is to maybe you've got two or three zones in the field, and you'd like to have that that sensor be able to say, oh, we're in a different um, management zone now. We need to be changing the reference value because the yield potential just isn't there. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple ways of doing this. One is to say in in the shepherd's on shepherd's algorithm, we have the uh, optimum nitrogen rate in there. Well, that's really a farmer value. Mm -hmm. we, we put that in there to say we want something that you're comfortable with to start with. Right, right. After the first year, you realize that you're putting on too much nitrogen. <laughs> He'll tear it down the second year. Uh -huh. And after a couple, three years, he's probably zeroed in pretty good about what the appropriate nitrogen rate is. Right. But uh, the other, I guess, a, a different way to skin the cat is to say we're going to adjust the reference value, sure. we're going to tinker with the management zone value. We're going to uh, play with the the optimum nitrogen rate. So there's there's right. two or three ways of getting at it. Mm -hmm. Sure. And the, it'll depend on. I think um, what it comes down to is that dual controller. Sure. So for, for a, a young electrical engineer, there's your target. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we have a few listening to the podcast. Yeah, members. that's right. <laughs> Uh, is there anything else that you would like to see done, you know, in the near future when it comes to sensor-based nitrogen, whether that's maybe integrating weather data or integrating anything else? What's, what else? I, I think that there's um, opportunities to, to use models. Mm -hmm. They can look into the future with some degree of, of accuracy, mm -hmm. 
um, they can probably identify extreme cases. Like if it's going to get dry as heck, you need to be careful here. Mm -hmm. or, right. or if you're counting on rainfall to incorporate this nitrogen into the soil, it's risk. Um, what are your chances of, of having rain yeah. within the next seven days? Yeah. Things like that. Um, you can never predict the, the large catastrophic events that uh, might result in excess nitrate leaching, okay. sure, especially on sandy soils. Yeah. Um, in, in those cases, this is where drones or, or aircraft can come in and say, oh my gosh, we're running into trouble here. We had a, a major loss event. We better get out there and fix it either with a pivot right. or, or with a, a high clearance sprayer. If, if you don't have a, the entire field needs to be fixed, this may be an opportunity for the sprayer version. But if it looks like 70 or 80% of the field needs attention, mm -hmm. turn the pivot on. Sure. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so all this sensor technology obviously still needs some development, but it's it has been shown to be useful, right? I mean, there, there have been a lot of studies that have shown that it makes people more efficient, can be more profitable. Can, can you talk a little bit about those studies and maybe where we do see those positive effects from using sensors? The, the most positive uh, effect or, or the most beneficial is probably on soils that have the greatest variability. The rolling land, mm -hmm. the manured fields, yep. uh, fields that have been terraced in the past, where they've done some earth moving, mm -hmm. created differences in organic matter and things like that. Yeah. And so um, this is where the, the sensors really have uh, a good place to, to use. I don't look for a, a whole lot of improvements or, or changes in the sensors, what they're monitoring. There, there's always people out there who have hyperspectral imagery and, and this sort of thing. And I say, they're out there to develop a better mousetrap. <laughs> but um, in reality, we have 30 or 40 years of, of science that says we're already locked in mm -hmm. on, on what's really important. Right. And so let's figure out how to use that um, so I think that if, if you've got fertigation, you can come pretty close to spoon feeding the crop and make a, a good improvement that way, whether you, you use the sensors or now there might even be ways to put sensors on a pivot as it goes around. Right. Like we talked about this 30 years ago. Sure. But the problem at the time was uh, getting the water on the leaves mm -hmm. that changes the reflectance of NIR and visible right. in opposite ways. Right. So that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Major problem if you're at the same time. <laughs> yeah, there, there's one more thing I was going to ask. What have you seen farmers get most excited about in terms of sensor based management? And where are we with adoption right now? The um, the adoption is, is not very high. And it's because farmers, some of them are intimidated by the technology. Some of them don't have high clearance sprayers. Most of them do not. Sure. But at, at the same time, they only want to go into the field one time. Mm -hmm. They're looking for the easy button. Yep. Right. And they're willing to pay a little extra for that convenience of having that easy button. Nobody is after them or charging them for over application. Right. And, and until farmers are only able to purchase, let's say 80% of the normal fertilizer, you're not going to get their attention. Right. But the, the farmers who we work with, they have a high clearance sprayer. And we started out by loaning them my set of sensors. I would ride with him. And this is on your own farm, right? Well, it, it's a farm south of Lincoln. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. But 
He's also a pilot, so he has a small airplane. Yeah. So he'd already been up and said, I'm ready for it. <laughs> sure. yeah. But uh, we put the sensors on and he's done this now for four years. And he was telling somebody last year, he said, this is worth about $50 an acre to me to be able to go in and fix those spots in the field. Huh. And, and it was two years ago, 1990, or 2019, we had a, a lot of extra rainfall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Had some, some leaching going on. Sure. And he, he uh, put on quite a bit of nitrogen with the sensors, but he had excellent yields. And he'd gone up with his airplane again <laughs> and, and showed us pictures of his fields that were quite uniform sure. compared to the neighbors that looked bad. <laughs> yeah. He said they wouldn't tell me what their yields were. Mm -hmm. Sure. But, but he said, uh, as I recall, his were averaging about 225. So he was pleased. And he keeps telling me, well, we tell him, why buy the cow when the milk is free? Meaning that if he can borrow my sensors, right? why don't you do it? He says, no, he says, it's time. He says, I'm game to, uh, to make the investment. I, I want to have it myself. And uh, he says, I've got neighbors who have the sprayers, yeah. but they don't have the sensors. And he says, they're asking lots of questions. <laughs> It's a good opportunity. Mm -hmm. So if other listeners would like to go and learn more about uh, the sensor-based nitrogen management, other than borrowing your set of sensors, where can they go to go learn more or potentially try it out? Unfortunately, folks, there, there isn't much. The Holland Scientific website is mostly geared for sales, mm -hmm. for information and sales. It's going to come down to folks like you. We're going to be doing the uh, education, provide the information. Sure. If they call me up, sure, I'll talk to them <laughs> and uh, loan them a sensor. Sure. And do these kind of things. But uh, marketing is probably the weak link right now. Hmm. Promotion and marketing. I talked to uh, Ag Leader about this, and they said, well, we make more money on selling yield monitors, planter control systems. Sure. And so it's it's not really a big part of our business. And we're not interested in developing this dual control controller, a dual input controller, mm -hmm. because it's a very small portion of society that would use it or want it. Mm -hmm. Sure. So I think it's going to come down to a, an entrepreneur sure. to develop this thing. And then the likes of John Deere or Case or somebody will buy it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, the, you know, it, there really is not a ton of information. I mean, I know we've had Project Sense going on here mm -hmm. for close to five years now. And mm -hmm. We're still working on trying to get some actual extension circulars out. And so if you're not at a field day where Samantha is yeah. speaking or something like that, <laughs> it's hard to find that uh, information out there on the web. Right now. Yep. So feel free to reach out to us. Sure. <laughs> or Dr. Shepherd's with questions. Yeah. And so we always like to end our episodes with asking for a piece of advice that you want to leave our listeners with. Uh, and in this case, on the topic of nitrogen management and specifically using technology for nitrogen management, if you'd rather tell a story instead of give a piece <laughs> of advice, I think we can also open up that uh, yeah. opportunity as well here. Well, uh, the, the advice is don't be complacent look around and, and think about that corn plant. There are other tests like the stock nitrate test. Mm -hmm. People say, oh, dang, I, it's late in the year. I can't do anything about it, but you can fix it for next year. Mm -hmm. Right, you can, can do something better next year. And, and the other thing is people get these yield maps and they go in a drawer. They, they don't get used efficiently mm -hmm. to understand what is driving the differences in yield. Mm -hmm. uh, farmers can also be their own little experimentation. Nothing major, but pick out a problem or two, and maybe even two or three farmers get together and talk and say, you know, 
this is a, a common problem. Maybe we have two of those. But let's think about who can can do this, who can do that. All right. Let's look around and try to understand what these systems are doing to us or how we can improve. Sure. But that takes commitment and and many people are afraid to say, I made a mistake. <laughs> They don't want the yeah. neighbor to know <laughs> what they're doing, uh -huh. good or bad. Right. And, and so they they keep all their information very private. Sure. So it seems like there almost has to be a, a paradigm shift in terms of how we yeah. approach improving operations out there. In, in Argentina, they have a, a system that basically is no extension service. And so they have groups of farmers, maybe 10 or 12, that have a little club, hmm. so to speak. And so they get together once a month to talk about these things and share information. They will even bring in specialists to, to talk to them about this or that. Interesting. But they've provided the, or, or generated the information, either among themselves or from somebody else. Sure. To get this done. Almost but it brings a whole new meaning to cooperative mm -hmm. in a way. Well, I just think about all the coffee shops across America that kind of serve that purpose for farmers. So that's in a way what's what's happening. Most of the coffee shops are bragging times, <laughs> <laughs> and not the, I shot myself in the foot twice, right? Yeah. <laughs> or or otherwise, is did you see that over there? Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep, that's interesting. That's very good advice. Yeah, I do have one more question i guess or I, I i guess comments i mean i talked to john gates i don't know if you know john gates um i do not crop x but he he was in i guess visiting new zealand uh for a little while and, and they're one of the only countries out there in the world that's really put some very stringent nitrogen application mm -hmm. uh, yeah. guidance in place and regulations and they're starting to see a lot of adoption of some of these sophisticated nitrogen management technologies. Okay. And so, I mean, I guess it's true, like what you said, but it's really going to take those types of regulations to drive people into this sort of management. If you mention regulations to farmers, <laughs> you better be looking for the door. Yeah. Right. <laughs> because they don't want to hear this. It means that they're going to have to step up. Dick Weiss, one of the former extension people here, he would go to coffee shops in the morning, Saturday mornings, <laughs> and talk to farmers. Mm -hmm. And one time he said to farmers, what are you going to do if you can only buy half as much fertilizer? Look around the room at each other, all oh, that will never happen. Well, it, it might be because some of the NRDs now are, are really cracking down on no fall fertilizer, yep. half the rate before planting, that, that sort of thing and, and pushing people into being more uh, spoon feeding or systematic, balancing right. and synchronizing nitrogen needs with nitrogen supply. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope it comes from a, a local level of like knowledge. I uh, think about like New Zealand, they yeah. was basically like you'd have to cut by 5% every year. It wasn't a, right. a regional, let's make better practices for the soil or whatever. One of the problems here with the, the NRDs is that they are, are faced with a fairly large area, mm -hmm. diverse soil types, mm -hmm. and yet they, they'd like to have a, a universal uh, recommendation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're meeting with lots of opposition. Mm -hmm. Right. What I've suggested to them is that they think about a car repair. A troubleshooter's guide, hmm. Some, something that says, okay, identify three or four of the key things, such as organic matter, slope, texture, these kind of things that are really important to nitrogen supply, leaching, this sort of thing. Sure. And develop a, a flow sheet where it, it categorizes you and mm -hmm. your field into a, a given category. That way, it's sort of fine tuned. Mm -hmm. And it gets buy-in, it gives the farmers an opportunity to have buy-in. 
sure to be part of the solution in, instead of only being perceived as being the cause of the problem. Mm -hmm. And that way they can see the process that goes into it as well. It's not just a number, mm -hmm. but it's the entire decision behind why they had to apply that much. Yeah. It's the uh, the board members on these NRDs. I'm not sure that some of them are farmers, but others are looking at the bigger picture. We want a regulation. Mm -hmm. We want to be the first to do this. Right. And, yeah. and they, they meet with lots of opposition. Mm -hmm. And and good good meeting opposition. Right. Yeah. Okay. It's a challenge. It is. Yeah. It's a it's a wicked problem to solve. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, good. Thank you to Dr. Jim Shepherds for joining us today on this episode of the Farm Fits Podcast. It was great to talk to him. He has been very instrumental in our research. And so it's always great to hear his stories, which is really what my favorite part was, is hearing the stories and the history behind this technology. It's not very often you get to hear, you know, from the decades ago, how it all got started and why we are where we are today. That was awesome. Yeah, so much context and he has so much experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and you really kind of heard that shine through with the interview. Um, and one of the things that I thought he said that was really poignant was that not all growers should use this on all of their acres. Uh, it's really built for those really variable fields. Um, and ultimately, adoption of this technology is kind of low and it may continue to be low until there's really kind of a motivating factor to reduce overall nitrogen applications, which is just interesting to think of in the overall context. Yeah, that methodology or thought behind that is so different than we've heard from a lot of other guests. And so it's always great to hear a new perspective for sure. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for joining us today. We hope we'll hear from you or um, you'll listen again next week as we continue our nitrogen management series. Thank you for taking the time to join us today on the Farm Bits podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts to be informed about the latest content each week. We welcome your feedback. So if you have comments or questions for us, please reach out to us over email, on Twitter, or in the review section of your favorite podcast platform. Our contact information can be found in the show notes. We'd like to thank Nebraska Extension for their support of this podcast and their commitment to providing high quality informational material to the members of the agricultural community in Nebraska and beyond. The opinions expressed by the hosts and guests on this podcast are solely their own and do not reflect reviews of Nebraska Extension or the University of Nebraska Lincoln. We look forward to you joining us next week for another episode of Farm Bits.